Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Nostalgia Trap podcast. I'm trying to say that very dramatically. My name is David Parsons. Uh, I'm happy that you're joining me, and I, I'm happy that you're listening to the program. Um, my guest today is someone I'm very excited to have talked to and finally got a, a chance to sit down with him. Um, his name is Thaddeus Russell. Uh, Thaddeus Russell is a professor of history, uh, someone whose work on American history is pretty well-known and actually pretty controversial in the field. Um, his book, A Renegade History of the United States, um, is a, a, a pretty... A uh, big bestseller, one that I, I tracked down in the Strand. I think I, I tell the story of finding this book this book a few years ago on the uh, during this conversation. Um, but but his work is 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 stuff that I I've used quite a bit in my classes as a kind of counterpoint to some of the major interpretations of American history. Um, and it was great to talk to him. Um, we we talked uh, mainly about you know. He has a very unique kind of upbringing, a unique um, political world he was surrounded by as uh, when he was a young person, um, and I, I think it had a lot uh, to do with you know kind of developing a lot of his attitudes and 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 kind of interpretive frameworks for American history. So we had a great time. Uh, it was it was awesome to finally sit down to to, to talk to him and, and and figure out a little more of uh, what makes him tick. So I hope you enjoy this conversation as I hope you enjoy all the Nostalgia Trap episodes. Um, they're all up at the at nostalgiatrap.com. Um, you can also find it on iTunes, Stitcher, Facebook, Twitter, all that. But if you go to nostalgiatrap.com, which is kind of the main site um, for the show, I, you'll notice that I put a donate button up there. Uh, I'm very you know, uncomfortable with, with all asking for money, um, and I'm trying not to sound like a pompous douchebag here. Um, but I do. I think the show is 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 important, um, and that's why I've 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 spent all my own money in kind of maintaining the show um uh, buying all the equipment for the show and 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 making sure that the show stays up and that i keep recording um conversations with all sorts of uh what i consider radical people uh, because i think these voices are voices that need to be heard um i do think we're entering into a, a, a an accelerated an accelerated american nightmare um, and as that happens, I, I think these voices and recording these voices and archiving them online and making sure that they stay online for free um, are, are, are something of a public service. There's that pompous douchebag alarm going off in my head right now. Um, but anyway, if you can find it in your heart uh, or your mind or wherever um, controls money in, uh, in your body to send me uh, a few dollars, that would be... Um, that would be wonderful for me. Uh, you are not required to do so. The show will remain free without advertisements and all that shit. Um, but otherwise, um, thanks for listening to the show. Um, this is my conversation with Professor Thaddeus Russell. Okay, so um, I've you know I've encountered your stuff many times uh, in books and, and social media. I love following your your point of view because you're one of those people that um, sometimes I look at your stuff and I'm like, this guy is a genius. This guy really gets it. And then other times I look at your stuff and I'm like, why, why the fuck is he saying this? <laughs> um, and I, those are my favorite kind of thinkers because yeah. you, you both like in, it often surprises me. And then I have to think I have to try to square my own uh, uh, thoughts. But part of what we do on this show, in the nostalgia trap, is like. I try to figure out a little bit of the, um, I don't know, the, the things that, 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 that happened to you in your life at, at a young age that kind of contributed to your political development, contributed to your ideas about American history and things like that. And I know you've got like kind of an idiosyncratic story a little bit, um, but are you from L.A. originally? No, I'm from no. Berkeley. Oh, wow. Okay. That, yeah. <laughs> that's yeah, a yeah. great place to start. Yeah, I uh, born in Berkeley in 1965. My parents at the time were members of the International Socialists, mm. revolutionary Trotskyist organization. Uh -huh. um, came out of Yipsil, Young People's Socialist League. Okay, right? uh, which became I the IS and other things. Um, so this isn't connected to like the SWP and the YSA and all those different Trotskyist organizations. Okay, yeah. interesting. Um, rivalrous with the SWP, not not viciously like they were rivalrous with like the Spartacists, and, mm -hmm. and certainly they hated the Maoists and the Stalinists. But um, God, yeah. it gets complicated on the left. It sure it? was, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, those those are my parents, um, and they were deep into it. I mean, they industrialized. You know, the word industrialized meaning that they took jobs in you know 
steel mills and truck driving and my mother was a clerical worker in order to organize the proletariat for revolution, mm. right? Y- uh, yeah, I mean, there, there are people that join the military to do the same thing. Yeah, so that's what yeah. the IS was basically instructing the cadres to do. Wow. Um, you didn't have to, but you were expected to do it. So a lot of people did that. So these were all, you know, like my parents, all highly educated, middle class, pretty much white people mm-hmm. um, doing this, right? Mm-hmm. So my stepfather worked uh, in steel mills, and he was a teamster with, a, with Safeway. He was a truck driver. Uh, my mother was a clerical worker, as I said, at UC Berkeley, you know, but organizing in the unions um, all, all through the 60s and then into the mid-70s. Um, mm. And we lived during that time in southwest Berkeley, which is sort of the ghetto of Berkeley, mm-hmm. kind of right on the Oakland border. If you know Berkeley, it's the Ashby Bart Station. I lived a block from there. I feel like I know what kind of white people your parents are a little bit. Uh, well, <laughs> no, you probably don't actually, because they were actually somewhat heterodox within Trotskyism, mm, mm. Uh, which actually is part of my story. So, um, my parents were deep into it clearly, but always had um, taste for sensual pleasure um (laughs) material pleasure Mm. you know always interested in food and travel and clothes and nice material stuff right which of course i mean the is wasn't at quite as puritanical as much of the left Mm -hmm. um but you know they weren't they just basically weren't interested in those things right Right. they wouldn't sort of rail against commercialism like a lot of the left does or consumerism but they you know they just weren't interested in it Mm. so my parents were. They were always very interested in that stuff. So, like, they would take trips. They made very little money, but they would save up all their money to take trips to Paris and, you know, go to the go to nice restaurants. And But we lived in poverty. I mean, mm. they made $11,000 combined a year for several years in the 70s when I was a kid. Um, like, I, you know, I remember, like, the guy from the credit card company coming to our door and, like, taking out a scissors and, and snipping my mother's credit cards in half. And, wow. And then, I wonder, like, do they still do that? They don't still do that. Do bouncing they? checks at the grocery store and getting busted by the cops at the grocery store when we, you know. Um, yeah, so this is serious sacrifice for the, you know, the cause. Um, but they always liked this stuff and the comrades didn't like this stuff. And I think that sort of chafed at them all those years. And they finally, by the sort of mid six seventies, by, by about 75, 76, they just left. They were just tired of it and wanted to make money and live well, or at least live better, which they did. And they've been doing that ever since my mother became a psychotherapist and mm. my stepfather became a, um, uh, sort of a county administrator for drug addiction and stuff, but um, so but we so I was gonna say we lived in Southwest Berkeley on the on the Oakland border. At the time, that was about four blocks from the Black Panthers National Headquarters, <laughs> which was on Shattuck Avenue, just right up the street. And so you know, and like we had like Bernadette Devlin from the IRA and Black Panthers sort of coming through our house and just sort of around. And like I was just around the hard left. I just the- wonder how aware are you of what any of that means at that age? I um, mean, did you, I, were you aware right. that your parents were different than the rest of America, you know, or, uh, or that your, <laughs> your, your family was doing something a little, a, a little off, the, off the map of, ma- of mainstream? Well, I mean, I just thought it was like being raised in a church. You know? mm. I was just like, that's mm. what you do. That's what you should do. That's what good people do. This is all good. I didn't understand what socialism was. Mm. Right. Um, and I didn't. And when I went to college, that was actually my mission was to understand socialism so that I could become a socialist. Yeah. <laughs> um, we'll get to that part of the story. Definitely. Yeah. We will. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. I mean, no, I just thought of them as sort of heroic figures. I mean, mm. I, in my adulthood, I realized that they were just terrible parents for <laughs> other other things, other reasons. But um you know, my childhood was not nearly as rosy as I thought it was mm. uh, for a lot of reasons. But, you know, so I. And I, I said to my mother once when I was like eight or nine years old, when I grow up, I want to be in the, I want to be in the IS. Oh. And she, oh. she would use, she used that in a speech. My mother was kind of one of the leading intellectuals in the Bay Area IS. You know? Wow. So, I, you know, that's another big part of my story is that I yeah. was raised in a household where like the, the mother, the woman was the sort of intellectual heavyweight. Mm. Um, so it's like – Feminism wasn't even. I mean, it was just take. It was just like part of the fabric, of, right? You know, it was, it like, was lived feminism. Yeah, we didn't have yeah. to talk about it. It's right. just like you know, my mother was the dominant presence. Yeah, your whole house was a safe space. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God, yeah, she hates all that shit. By yeah, the way. Um, well, a lot of the a lot of the the older feminists do. I think. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, so. Yeah. So and then like you know, it was a very racially integrated neighborhood. Mm-hmm. It was basically working class. It wasn't poor, but it was definitely working class. Um, about f- probably two thirds black, one third white, um, and so I had a lot of black friends, and I became sort of 
fascinated with black culture. And this mm-hmm. is when, when I'm in a, when I'm about 10 years old, this is when Roots comes out, the first mm-hmm. Roots. And that was huge. And I read all of Roots, the book, under the covers in my bed with a flashlight. Wow. Um, became really into sort of black pop culture and music. And mm-hmm. so my stepfather was into like soul and R&B. It's a good time for it. It was a great time. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, being right there basically in Oakland. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like Shaft is coming out and like that kind of vibe is like. Yeah. This is kind of late black exploitation, And yeah. I, didn't, I didn't actually get into black exploitation until much later because it was sort of scary when I was a kid. <laughs> yeah. Now yeah. I think it's one of the greatest art forms ever. Yeah. We can talk about that if you yeah. want. But yeah. yeah, it's funny. And, it's and it's, it's funny and weird and always surprising when you watch those movies. I think politically it's it's awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I've actually written about that. But I think and f- from my politics, Superfly is basically the perfect movie. <laughs> now, I'm, now I'm going to go home and watch that. Yeah, it is the perfect <laughs> yeah. movie po- politically for me. Um, yeah. So anyway um, – can I ask you about yeah, your, your parents' sure. culture? I mean, yeah. uh, uh, I mean, this is a prime. And when I think of Berkeley in the '60s to the '70s, I think of you know the prime time, the hippie stuff. Is that is that impacting your family at all? Yeah, good question. Um, there's a great um, moment. Actually, it's more than a moment. They spend a fair amount of time in it in the movie Berkeley in the '60s. Yeah. Yeah, if you're interested in any, any of this stuff, it's actually a very fine documentary. And yeah, they, I, I've shown it a lot in class. Yeah, they actually, okay, my mother's in that. She's, yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, she's in one of the sit-ins, one of the civil rights sit-ins. She's, oh, wow. She's in the lower right corner. Um, um, they do actually develop the argument, which it didn't never occur to me until I saw the movie, that there was the new left, mm-hmm. sort of the hard politicos like my parents, and then there was the counterculture sort of hippie movement. In, and, and, and so in the Bay Area, you know, it manifested uh, in the hippies being in San Francisco, generally speaking. Right. And the hard new left being in Berkeley, generally speaking. And that's about, that's about right, you know. Um, I think that's true. So I was obviously around the hard left politico types. But as I said, my parents, they weren't, they weren't really counterculture. Culture. They weren't really hippies. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you saw pictures of them now, you would think of them as hippies. But yeah. they weren't really of that. It became was, a broader definition after the period, it seems like. There was some weed. My father, who we haven't talked about, was also in the movement um, at that time. And he smoked a lot of weed and was a nudist. He was actually, in some ways, more more of a hippie. Mm. Um, you know, lots of drinking and rock. And, like, you know, the Rolling Stones would be playing in my yeah. house. Yeah, that yeah. kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So, um and my like my stepfather went to Altamont, the famous yeah, Stones yeah, yeah. concert, infamous Stones concert, where uh, dude got stabbed by the Hell's Angels. Yeah, but like yeah. my mother was into like Broadway show tunes, you know, so it wasn't like it, it was just a nice sort of eclectic mix in yeah. my household, which I really appreciate. Um, so I always loved hippies, and I still think they were basically right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, what's funny is me too, I, I, and and what I, I it's been kind of my hobby horse for a while is the hippie hatred in our culture because it's it's like such a i mean it's kind of ubiquitous on on basically all sides like everybody hates is united in their hatred of hippies yeah left people hate hippies right people hate hippies i mean everyone hates them and i'm like these are people who literally were just like their message was simple (laughs) well so (laughs) as you know the last chapter in my book deals with the hippies and When I actually researched them <laughs> as a scholar, I was profoundly disappointed, unfortunately. But um, in that, you know, in my book, I talk about how a lot, a lot of sort of back to the land part of the hippie yeah. movement oh, God. was yeah. deeply puritanical mm-hmm. and patriarchal. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of those, I mean, most of those communal farming experiments like la- failed laughably. Like they, they well, good. I they mean, were the, bad at growing the food. The worst ones were the ones that succeeded, right? Because <laughs> then people are just working all the fucking time, right? Right. Because that's what farming is. And then the women, of course, ended up doing the worst labor, sort of the domestic labor, and being stuck in the home all day long. And it was just work. Mm-hmm. And it was very puritanical, mm-hmm. right? So there's a there. I always I've always been aware of the puritanical element of hippie culture, mm-hmm. which is I don't like at all, of yeah. course. I mean, it's religious in a lot of ways. So I think even it, within yeah. hippie dumb, there mm-hmm. is. There are several splits, and I think that could we could identify that as a split. There's sort of the puritanical, vegetarian, back to the land, anti materialism, anti consumerism, hippie stuff. And then there's the uh, work sucks, leisure is good, pot is good, sex is good, um, pleasure more, is good. More of an anarcho hippie. More of a, um, I'd say, you know, the lyrical left of the 20s, Greenwich yeah. Village. Well, I, I just or, hate the or, humorless hippie. Or you know what I mean? 50s beatnik-y. <laughs> yes. that, that kind of very small but lovely strain in the American left. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that I really like. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Emma Goldman ish kind of sure. to, you know. Um so anyway, yeah, I mean I I obviously am very um influ- in my work and in my thinking and my politics, I'm influenced by that strain mm-hmm. um in, in hippie dumb. Which so, might yeah. surprise a lot of people, I think, because you don't come off as a hippie kind of dude. <laughs> um, but you have a there's a cha- the chapter you're referring to in your book, um, which is called "A Renegade History of the United States," and it's a book I've used a lot as a as a kind of counterpoint to a lot of mainstream American histories in my classes. Um, you have a chapter about hippies and rednecks. Yeah, can you talk a little bit about hippies and rednecks? Because yeah. it's something that I, um, you know, there's a there's a guy. I mean, one guy that I think of when I when I think of that is uh, Graham Parsons, um, who. Uh, and a lot of those like kind of Southern rock dudes of, of the 60s and 70s era that, that kind of like mixed this redneck hippie thing. But mm-hmm. what are you thinking of when you when you say that? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, one of the major themes in the book is sort of an extended critique of Puritanism in all its forms in American history, you know, from the original Puritans all the way to the present time. And I decided that it would be good and useful to compare the hippies and the redneck, uh, sorry, country music, really, of the 1960s and 70s. Yeah. Um, because surprisingly, you'll see a lot of Puritanism in both. You'll see in both, I argue, um, uh, movements towards a hedonism, movements towards or movements away from work and the work ethic, movements toward pleasure – but then a sort of collapsing back in on traditional puritanical values, right? Mm-hmm. So in, in country music, I mean, this is a little more obvious to people, but mm-hmm. country music for a time in the 30s, 40s, and 50s had quite a bit of, you know, there were lots of songs about partying and drinking and sex, basically, right? It was sort of a, a rebel, rednecky vibe there. Mm-hmm. But then, of course... In about the 1960s, much of country music becomes a reaction to the counterculture, right. becomes a reaction to the new left, becomes a reaction to the anti-war movement and the civil rights movement, blah, 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 and the feminist movement, right? And becomes very much sort of an embrace of the family mm-hmm. and all the responsibilities and all and the like strictures of it. Patriotism. Yeah. And then patriotism, of course, mm-hmm. right? So they wrap themselves in the flag and it's all about, you know, you're good if you work all fucking day in a factory and then go to war in Vietnam and die for your country. <laughs> that seems hard. That's the good life. <laughs> yes. Right, and then that's I'm sure your listeners are very well aware of that, and that's probably when they think of country, they think of that, and that's not entirely that's basically correct. But you'll see like a tension though. That's why so many people say in country, I like all music except country. Yeah, yeah. Right. so I actually well, that's a different story, but I actually <laughs> yeah. love con- contemporary, really, really cheesy Nashville country. But anyway, <laughs> um, no, but you'll see like an interesting tension, especially in the '70s outlaw mm. country, like yeah. Waylon Jennings and Merle Haggard in particular yeah. is very, very interesting. Everyone should go study some Merle Haggard. Oh, I love that stuff. Well, you don't have to yeah. love it, but it's really interesting. If you look at Merle Haggard in particular, he has several songs in which he kind of – he's actually voicing that tension between really wanting to leave his job, mm-hmm. really wanting to go on the road away from his family implicitly. Mm. Uh, and But then at the end of the song, he's like, well, but I got to go back to my work and my life. Drawn by duty. Yeah. Yeah. And it's sort of – it's tra- it's I call it the promise and tragedy mm. of country music. Mm. You know? mm-hmm. And it's – to me, that's tragic. I mean, it's according to your politics and your values, of course, sure. right? And I don't make any claims that s- someone who val- – that the values of family and work are bad or immoral is they're just not mine. Yeah. And so all I'm trying to do politically – is trying to identify people who share my values and then try to build some sort of movement to expand our freedom. So how would you become such a lazy person that hates work? Because, yeah, right. <laughs> because um, it sounds like your parents had a kind of d- a, 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 a feeling of duty to some form of labor. Um, yeah, but, uh, what sure. I, the, the, I think if there's one thing that resonates most uh, with your uh, work with me, uh, your, your, your written work, your book, uh, Renegade, it's that it's that idea that idea that there that each American has this little Puritan inside of them that's kind of like pushing them to work and feel bad if they're not doing something and to me you know that point resonates with me a lot and I see it in every in essentially everybody I know this kind of like association with labor as a moral good mm-hmm. so at what point in your life do you recognize that and reject that yeah late late in life I mm. mean I mean meaning like I don't know late graduate school <laughs> yeah uh, like I was way into my 30s I think when I that came together as an idea mm-hmm. um it was just I just it was just one of those things was like the breathing the air, you know. Uh and then when you, I was a part of the left, I mean <laughs> the left has got it as bad as anyone, you know. It's the work ethic is implicit in left politics, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. In particular, in Marxist left politics, Bernie wants us all working in factories again, man. That's that's a. I think you just quoted one of my tweets. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I he, think so. Actually, does. yeah. Well, that's the, what's one of the 
interesting similarities between uh, Bernie and Trump is that I think that's what their nostalgia is. They're nostalgic for people, Americans working in factories. I know that's true for Bernie. Michael Moore has that nostalgia. Oh, Every single absolutely. one of his fucking movies is like, oh, the 50s were oh, awesome. Have and you like, heard him in interviews waxing nostalgic about yes. you know, his his neighborhood in Flint where every, when everyone was, was an auto worker? Capitalism, I mean, a love story, is literally that. So my mm-hmm. thing is like, okay, man, that's not wrong or mm-hmm. it's bad. It's just I don't fucking want to work in a factory. Do you want to work in a factory? Mm-hmm. Raise your hand if you want to work in an auto plant. I understand the wages were higher and there was job security, but don't we want to sort of move beyond that as a life, as mm-hmm. the good mm-hmm. life? Is that mm-hmm. your a vision of a good life? Is that what socialism will bring? If so, then I'm done. Also, just the uh, just uh, relentless production of shit for no reason. If you just you know what I mean, like that. There's a there's an environmental aspect to it too. That I, that I know you're not a huge like not, climate not, change dude or anything. Not like, a but, fan of that. Yeah, I'm I'm all about I'm all about make more shit until all, it's well, all. I'm not, 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 not more, more shit, but I'm about <laughs> making things that make life better. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I think automobiles were fantastic things. Generally mm. speaking, I hate traffic, you know, mm-hmm. and, I, and I hated the smog in LA when there was smog in LA. But generally speaking, it made wait. There's still there's no smog in LA. There's anymore? no smog in LA. <laughs> it made it made human life far, far, far better, mm-hmm. you know. And like I know, smart lefties get that. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah. I, actually, the good Marxists are the ones who actually do get that. Mm-hmm. Um, but a much of the sort of dumber left, which is most of the left, does not get that. So, uh, your when is when is your ex- ex- experience with the left? Is it in college? I mean, you, where do you go for when your? I was born. For, I explained that. <laughs> well, I know that, but I mean, you got you you actually yeah. as an adult person, you know, yeah. um, right. engage with the left. What as an undergrad? Uh, all the way through. Yeah, I mean, all the way through until <laughs> until I became until me. the schism. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I'm not even sure it's a total schism, but yeah. Um, but were you an activist? I mean, did you work, or were you just kind of like a like a mm-hmm. fellow traveler? I did some. I did some activism, not mm-hmm. a lot, but I did some. I was a professional activist for two years after after college. Um, Wait, for, where did you go to undergrad? Yeah, so let's yeah. Well, that's speaking of the left. I went to Antioch College, okay, in Ohio, which is mm-hmm. famously hard left um is really, that why you chose that place sort of anarchistic no i i so i got i had like a c average in high school mm-hmm. and had like zero prospects and didn't even know what colleges were out there i didn't mm-hmm. know any i was just hopeless and smoked a bunch of weed after high school and didn't know what to do and sort of my friend happened to be going to antioch and she came home from uh for winter break and said oh i go to this college in ohio you should check it out so i was like okay fine Antioch was in such dire straits then. It was almost bankrupt that they were admitting everyone who applied. Um, I didn't know that at the time. But nice. I, I thought it was this great you know, coup that I got into this college. But I went, and it actually was wonderful for me, uh, even, in part because it was so near bankruptcy. And it meant it, it was very free yeah, um, and very small classes. And teachers paid attention to me for the first time and paid, paid attention to me as an intellectual, mm-hmm. which is really all that teaching is, good teaching is. Mm-hmm. You know, I came to understand myself as a teacher. You pay attention to your students as intellectuals mm-hmm. and have an intimate uh, relationship with them as an intellectual, mm-hmm. an intimate intellectual, mm-hmm. then you're a good teacher. And you treat under- undergrads like you're running a graduate seminar a little bit. Treat them. Yeah. I say to them, I'm going to treat you like intellectuals. Yeah, yeah. Right. I'm going to take your ideas seriously, it means, which means I'm going to challenge them too. So I had that, you know, for the first time. I had a couple of really good college professors who really turned me on to this, and I just thought, oh, this is the good, this is the good life. Not working in an auto factory, but being a college professor. Mm. <laughs> little did I know. Mm. Um, so yeah, and Antioch was, you know, this was the mid '80s, basically, when I was there, and you know, it was very countercultural. Mm. More of that than kind of a hard left political presence, but there was that too. The anarchists kind of ran the place, yeah, the political culture of it. Okay. Um, if anyone knows, uh, Murray Bookchin was the main dude at Antioch. Now he wasn't there, but like his Bookchinites were the main. <laughs> no, and those are my best friends. That's why. So I sort of cut my teeth arguing with Bookchinites. Okay. From a socialist yeah. perspective, yeah, yeah. so I, I fancied myself a socialist after like a year or two. By the time I figured out what it meant, mm-hmm. you know, and I actually read some Marx and I read sort of the great some of the great socialist tracks, etc. I joined DSA, mm-hmm. um, not in any serious way. I was never like an activist for DSA, mm-hmm. but I brought I, I brought Stanley Aronowitz to yeah. Antioch to speak yeah. when I was there, and I brought Joanne Landy. Some people might know her. Um, also, she was in the IOS with my parents and became a very important sort of um, activist. Has, still is, has been for decades on kind of foreign policy stuff. And this uh, is like during the Reagan years. This is hard Reagan years. Yeah. This is mid Reagan years. Yeah. Um, and so I kind of, you know, I, I was sort of introduced to the lunacy of the campus left then, too. Mm-hmm. Um, I loved the countercultural stuff in Antioch. I loved the hippies. I loved, like, P. 
people frolicking naked in the mud during rainstorms. Kind of a Grateful Dead thing going on. Serious Grateful Dead thing. Lots of weed. Not a lot of drinking. Some drinking, but not in a sort of nasty way. Psychedelics? Quite a bit of psychedelics. Mm -hmm. A lot of acid. Some mushrooms. Did MDA. My second year. Mm -hmm. Greatest experience of my life. It should be required in all the schools. (laughs) Um, I mean... Part of the common core. And I mean like elementary schools. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. No. That's what I I just wanted to clarify. Uh, I, I can get... I can get with that. Yeah. Um, so I loved all of that, and I loved there was lots of there's a big punk rock scene there at Antioch, yeah, yeah. and a lot of artists and poets and that kind of, and a big sort of gay scene. Mm-hmm. And it was just kind of wonderful. Yeah, and really, li- truly liberated, and like what the '60s, the best of the '60s, you know, right. what what it produced. Right. right. Then there was sort of this crazy, you know. Hard identitarian, I suppose, left going on. Not not as bad as now. Mm. Not nearly as bad mm-hmm. as now. But you know, it was there. So every once in a while, there would be some invented hate crime mm. on campus, mm-hmm. and there yeah. was a huge thing. And it turned out it was either completely a fraud, or like someone did it, you know, um, or it didn't exist at all. Just cycles of controversies. Yeah, yeah, cycles of outrage and controversies, and like which has just been like with the internet, just turned into an every like there's one every minute. Yeah, yeah. So the great, the kind of one of the defining moments in my life actually really was that uh, my senior year, I was the editor of the newspaper, and two kids, two students, during some party, grabbed like these crosses that they they had put up. They had done this like sort of exhibit that was basically anti-christian mm. right okay which of course that's fine at Antioch, yeah. no problem and so they'd put these crosses on the wall and at one point and there was a there was a fire in a in a garbage can right and at one point during this like performance art thing they grabbed one of the crosses and threw it into the can of fire mm. okay so if you saw this you knew it was anti-christian right. no, no 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 this became the ku klux klan was on campus oh wow they yeah. got expelled Christ. For that. Literally, Even though it had yeah. nothing to yeah. do with race whatsoever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. long story. But anyway, so that kind of showed me that the left is not only crazy, but can be... Um, Irrational. Well, tyrannical. Yeah. Right. I mean, because mm-hmm. these kids, you know, really, it really hurt them. And, they're mm-hmm. just, you know, I wouldn't say it destroyed their lives, but it certainly hurt them mm-hmm. in their careers and it made their lives much more difficult. So, you know, sort of a Maoism, I suppose, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's, it's hard because it's like so much of that stuff is like... And we talked about this before before we started recording, the kind of like silly, silly campus left stuff that's become now so much bigger than it used to be. And when I say bigger, I mean, I, I don't know, it's more forceful on campus, but also just why, in the wider culture. I think most like, I mean, it's because of social media, it's coming out, but you, you see it a lot more. Um, yeah. But how much is it just like, I feel like a lot of those kids are going to grow out of that stuff. I feel like a lot of kids are going to oh, like sure. eventually. I mean, <laughs> I, I went to UC Santa Barbara in the 1990s, and it was, you know, what we would call SJWs today, mm-hmm. kind of ran the campus, and it was yeah. those kind of controversies always. And uh, I, I saw them as, it's funny, because they were the same kids that I went to high school with, and they were always the same, they were like, I thought of them as rich white kids. Like I thought of that that crew of like well, the most the loudest most obnoxious ones. Well, it's rich white and black kids. Yeah, yeah, and Latino kids. It's, sure, it's, it's basically a phenomenon of the upper and middle classes. It seems like it. Well, sorry, but the American left has always been a phenomenon mm-hmm. of the upper and middle classes. I mean, you know, and that's not true in every country, but it's certainly been true here by and large. Um, yeah, it's, I'm reminded of this great line. Ir- I'm no fan of Irving Howe, but he had this great line where he was at Stanford at some point in the '60s, and like you know, this is when he was like sort of a sort of, you know, sort of mainstream socialist, if there is such a thing, but n- meaning not like a revolutionary Marxist socialist, but, um, and some like, you know, some Trotskyist or Maoist kid like from Stanford comes up to him and starts haranguing him on the quad. Mm. Mm-hmm. And Howe turns to him and says, when you grow up, you're going to be a dentist. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's probably true in most cases. That guy, I think that guy actually ended up becoming a doctor or something, but, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> So yeah, of course. I mean, I it's d- a phase of development, is what I'm yeah, saying. Yeah, and so absolutely. and so when I see it, when I see it, yeah. I mean that that's why when I see like, um, I, I guess it disturbs me when I see it like uh, they're trying to f- get professors fired and things like that that over really stupid shit. Yeah. That really bothers me. Right. Um, when they're and that's why, yeah. And well, I was I was able to, to I'm able to dismiss it as like at a stage of adolescence, um, and, and and in some ways like an important one. I think it's important that people come to terms with justice in some way and figure it out. Sure. Um, and figure out that this society is fucked for some people more than others. Um, but it's like it's like uh, you know it's 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 the born again Christian. 
You know, it's the person that first when they first come to yeah. this information, there's a kind of like sure. intense passion for it, right? Sure. Uh, it's the George W. Bush, you know, the guy that discovers Christianity late in life, oh, and all yeah. of a sudden it's like <clears throat> it's everything. It's everything to him. Yeah, and and I feel like when students get to college, many students get to college, they've never thought about this material at all. And they, they come to it and they freak out and they get right. really and and later on they kind of like are embarrassed later. Yeah, and I mean unfortunately so much of it, especially nowadays, seems to me to be narcissistic performance. Yes. Well, we talked about that with Freddie DeBoer, the kind yeah. of like idea right. that like, you know li- much of liberalism is performative, right? It's kind of like about right. indicating that. Like you know, this election has made me more, more aware than ever before how much it's about language. It's about like kind of like you get in the door by speaking correctly and right. learning the, the 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 professional way of speaking and learning that there are certain words you use and certain words you don't use. Right. Um, and that's a kind of a dangerous politics because it's not really politics. Yeah, I also see quite a bit of sadism in it. I mean, I think that, no, I really I think there's a lot of pleasure being gained from shaming other people. Oh and, yeah, and from virtue signaling in ways that sort of identify others as the immoral it's very rem- I, i've been studying the cultural revolution in china a bit lately and it's just really reminiscent i mean it's really not to say that these people are maoists and they're going to actually you know put people in camps but it's the the sort of fundamental political sensibility i suppose is very similar to maoism in that way um, and it, this, this it's public shaming that yeah goes and it's on, witch right? trial stuff too yeah. it's back to your pur- yeah. puritan stuff about i mean the idea of like there is a right way to be and yeah. we will gather around you and check you until right. you are that or we will banish you okay so before you know let's i want to be clear about my position on all this you know so i mean forever and ever and ever since i've been since my first day in college i was very aware that it must really be terrible or not terrible very difficult to be a black kid on one of these campuses yes. right you're basically plucked out of these neighborhoods by these colleges for a purpose mm-hmm. right i blame i entirely blame uh racial liberalism and the sort of campus left and then sort of liberals generally for this thing they created it mm. they pluck these kids out of these neighborhoods put them in isolation in these white institutions surrounded by mostly white kids who don't who've not been around black people etc they are there for the purpose of showing that that institution is virtuous. They are there to sort of – to enrich the education of the white kids. Mm-hmm. This has been stated. Yeah, this they're is, tokens. This is, one of the pur- this is one of the stated purposes of diversity yeah. is to enrich the education of the white kids, mm-hmm. right? Now, wouldn't that make you crazy too? Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, wouldn't it make you angry? I'm not yeah. even saying they're crazy. They're not crazy. They are, they're completely right to be pissed off about this. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, of course, they're 18 years old. They're 19 years old. So <laughs> often it's hard for them to make sense of what's going on, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So for me, it's, it is a system of racial paternalism. Mm. That is what's going mm-hmm. on. That's what I see. And mm-hmm. I, that's the way I see black people being treated on campus and Latinos too, um, there's been some identification of that, I think, in the last year or two, but not much, right? Mm-hmm. So what ends up usually happening is they misidentify it as a different kind of racism, which is the violent segregationist racism, mm-hmm. which is the kind that you get taught in the classes. KKK they don't, racism. They don't, because the classes are taught by liberals, the liberals aren't critiquing themselves. They aren't critiquing their own politics about race, which is a racial liberalism, which mm-hmm. is paternalism, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I just can't even tell you how many times I've seen black people be patronized in mm. colleges mm. And, and i've been you know i've been in and around colleges for 35 years now i mean it's and i've seen it every year i mean in all kinds of ways and from from adjunct professors doing it to administrators to very very famous scholars i mean i've seen them treat black colleagues and black students and black graduate students in patronizing ways that makes me sick um in addition to the fact that they're just as i said you know affirmative action and diversity really is about pulling these black people in for purposes that serve the institution. Yeah. Right? Right. That's why they're there. Right. Um, it's fairly disgusting. Yeah. So so it's kind of like the chickens coming home to roost, in my view. <laughs> right? Yeah. And right. I, so in, in one way, I like stepping back and just watching the whole thing, you know, burst into flames. <laughs> um, and I just hope it all burns down, basically. I want. I would like to see. I think a lot of people share your your sentiment in, di- <laughs> in different ways, though. Um, I, w- I wanted to go back a little bit and, and and understand a little bit more about you know at what point are you like I am no long I'm not oh my god like I'm not a socialist like you because okay. it sounds like you're like yep. really on that track for a while. Yep. Um, and then at what point do you right. turn the page of a book and be like, what this is what this is about? Yeah. Okay. So I became you know. Was, very sure I was a socialist. I was mm, kind of a Marxist. Um, 
and in college, and then uh, decided I was going to become an academic. Well, just for a while, so I left college and went and was a professional activist for a couple of years. I did like Central America solidarity work, ah. labor, labor, yeah. Central American labor solidarity work for two years. Uh, kind of worked for an organization that kind of coordinated um, activities uh, between U.S. unions and Nicaraguan and Salvadoran wow. unions. Yeah. yeah. Um, Kind of cool. I mean, now I'm not sure what I think about the politics of that, mm-hmm. but, you know, at the time it was very cool for me. And then during that period, I decided not to be a, a social justice lawyer, not warrior, <laughs> lawyer. Yeah, uh, S- and in, the, the SJL. <laughs> and instead do what you're supposed to do when you're a left winger, uh, go, go into the academy. So <laughs> I um, applied to a bunch of graduate schools and got barely into Columbia without any money, without any funding. And went and found out that you had to sort of prove yourself in the first year. And if you did, you got funding, which I did after mm-hmm. the first year. So then I was kind of, oh, I made it. I'm is here. this like the late 80s this or the 90s? 91, 92. Wow. Yeah. Um, your man, Josh Freeman, was instrumental in that, by the way. So And, mm-hmm. your, and your man, Eric Foner, was also instrumental mm-hmm. in that. So those guys. These are me. not my men. These are people I know. <laughs> they've, been on the sh- they've been on the show. <laughs> they have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, yeah, and Alan Brinkley was my guy. Uh-huh. Too, wow. So, so yeah. And I, and then, so Big I, names. Yeah, well, it's Columbia. Yeah. yeah. So, I, and that was my first, my first time in my life where I was like playing in that world of sort mm-hmm. of heavyweights, you know, right. kind of like you know, sort of celebrities in my world, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's exciting. Yeah. Romantic. Was, I felt like it was the first time in my life. I felt like, oh, I could actually do something. It's important. quite a campus up there. Yeah, I hate. Feel I mean, like... I hated Columbia, <laughs> and I still hate it. Everyone who's been there hates. I was it. talking about the architecture. <laughs> <laughs> it, it tells you you're a piece of shit. Basically, yeah. <laughs> that's that's the whole message. That's what's intended. Like, hello, you're you're inferior to us. You will learn from us, motherfucker, and do what we say. And by the way, we run the whole world. So is, it, is that what it says in in, in, in the Greek? Not, in Greek, Greek, right there above says, the columns. That's you're exactly, ours, motherfucker. That's what it yeah. says. That's <laughs> quoting Aristotle. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> actually, Plato. Sorry, Plato's the close guy. enough. Plato says that. Yeah, Aristotle's a little better. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, I was imposed. I was intimidated by it from the beginning. Mm-hmm. Very imposing. Yeah, I, I write. I've written about the architecture of Columbia. Actually, my Huffington Post piece about this. But um, certainly not a working class vibe going on at Columbia. <laughs> no. Yeah, and so I, there's a, there's a there's a Marxist left up there, and it certainly was in the '90s. Yeah, but a minority. You know, it was basically run by New Deal liberals, mm-hmm. um, with with a sort of uh, important Marxist minority. In the history department, certainly. I mean, there the, was really the history department then in the U, on the U.S. side was really split between those two camps, mm. um, kind of old school New Deal liberals and then kind of younger Marxist types. But um, so, yeah, so I moved to New York, do that and kind of make my place in Columbia and kind of am playing around with the New York left a bit, doing kind of some activism, just sort of being around more of the intellectual left of the Morningside Heights, Upper West Side, right? And what are you what are you studying in school? Like, what is there have yeah, you found so, like a, a focus? At so, Columbia? yeah, I mean, I'm in the U.S. history section of the history department at Columbia and then I'm doing I oh, so. You know, I was going to be the next big social historian, mm-hmm. um, and really, it was uh, it was an, I had an activist intent from the beginning, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So I, I was like, huh, I don't really need to be a scholar. I don't really need to teach, uh, write books. I just want to teach and sort of advance the cause through through teaching. Really, yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I think a lot of people convince themselves that that's, that's oh, yeah. the life they want. Oh, yeah. totally, I mean, yeah. it sounds close to what I was thinking. I'm like, yeah, oh, no, it's, it's a, like it's it's a teaching is a way not to hurt. It's a good thing. Like it's yeah. a very positive moral force. When too. you're when you're a 22 year old social justice, whatever I was, you know, socialist, whatever. It's a great life. Well, it's the only life yeah. <laughs> to have, right? And to do. What I'm you still want trying to, do. to figure out what the other one is. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, I will help. I'll help you with that. <laughs> right. um, so. Um, yeah, so I'm kind of really immersed in that kind of left liberal New York City scene of the 1980s. And mm-hmm, mm-hmm. God, I was just like, no one cares what they wear. <laughs> <sighs> like, you're a famous, famous professor, you know, and you have a hole in your sweater. <laughs> your shoes haven't been changed since you were a grad student in the 1970s, man. There's something wrong. I mean, this, this is really important. Like, there was just no interest. In the sensual world, mm. no interest in the pleasures that your body can give to you, no interest in the material world. No, I mean, they, I suppose they listen to classical music or something. But like, the only thing you're going to get from professors like that is there'll, there'll be a few drunks among just, them. 
You know, there'll be a few. Those were the ones I'd hang out with. In <laughs> Columbia, they were too, there weren't any. I, not that I was aware. No one seemed like a drunk. Quiet alcohol. The drunks thing. that I've known have been actually the ones I want to hang out with. Mm-hmm. But basically, my point is these were not people I wanted to hang out with. A, B, they were so sort of culturally conservative. They were culturally conservative. Yeah, yeah. Um, psychologically conservative, mm-hmm. right? Um, They've got that Puritan in them working yeah. overtime. And it's just like there was this very um, just – highly disciplined rigid culture there that i just it's hated. funny because that's how i've felt in academia a lot is kind of like i'm not i like the this i like the the uh, uh, academic pursuits i like the discipline of history i like but at the same time i don't feel like i'm like these people that's my, that, that's interesting. That's yeah, always, that was always my feeling. Yeah, right? always my feeling. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, hope, <laughs> I thought I was I mean, special. It's a product. I mean, <laughs> and part for me, it's a product. And maybe this is true for you too. I don't know if it's true. Um, I came to an East Coast college, and yeah, I'm from California, and yeah. they're like people that are like, men should never wear shorts. Right. Like I, got, I, I heard that from several professors. It's actually like, really important. Men people, should never wear shorts. Yeah, I'm yeah. like, I was raised around flip flop shorts people. This is really actually very important. Yeah. I mean, this, so this goes to the puritanism of, of left wing culture, you know, and and I mean, and I include sort of liberalism in that too, right? Um, it's really so if you value a life in which pl- pleasure is valued, or a world in which pleasure is valued, you need to think seriously about this. And I, I saw. I just saw – it was just such a depressing, gray, puritanical vision that I saw. Mm-hmm. And then also yeah. – and so in terms of the scholarship and mm-hmm. like what people studied and what people wrote about, you see it as well, right? Certainly then. It's much better now. But certainly by the 1990s, I mean I read how many hundreds of books, history books during that time mm-hmm. as a graduate student? Mm-hmm. Um, no mention of sex. Mm-mm. I'm not kidding. Like no mention of sex. They were just discovering gender. Forget sex, you know. Um, no mention, hardly any mention of popular culture, right? This was when pop culture studies was just beginning. Like it was – and it was still – and at Columbia, they looked down on it like it was the stupidest thing you could imagine. Um, I think a lot still do. It's much better now, yeah. of course. Yeah. But then it was just – I mean it was all about economics and political institutions and social movements. Uh-huh. Political movements, uh-huh. social political movements. No drugs either. Oh God, no! I mean, I wanna, my first year, yeah. I the, at the CUNY Graduate Center, I, 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 you know, we were first year research paper, pick a topic, and I said I wanted to write on um, drugs in the counterculture in the sixties and in Berkeley scene, you know, and uh, what mm-hmm. role did LSD play in politics? And they were just looked at me like I was from another right. planet, like why that's not something worth, yeah, it's just even not. thinking about, yeah, exactly, yeah. which is insane because there are like, I mean, there are books outside of academia that have written about. LSD that are like it's right. a fucking intense history. Right. So this was the new left historiography, right? This was the, these are the people who trained me and I'm probably sh- I'm sure you, you some as of well. the same people, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, these are the these are the people of the 60s and 70s. Mm-hmm. These are the politicos of Berkeley, not the hippies of San Francisco, um, or the politicos of New York City, I suppose. Um, more SDS and less yippie. Yeah, yeah. certainly. Yeah, right, exactly. Um, so, I mean, what they had just done was very valuable, though, which was to replace the old top-down histories, the great man histories, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Of the 40s and 50s, mm-hmm. of the Hofstetters and the Schlesingers and all that. Let's know? not shit on this generation of historians no, no, completely. No. I could not yeah. do any of my work without them, mm-hmm. without what they did. There's no doubt about that. No question about it. What they did was they replaced that with this, you know, what they called bottom-up, although we found out later that it wasn't actually the bottom, but – you know, they put the new, they put this, the heroes of the left history, you know, in the center of the narrative, mm. right? Mm. And so, you know, you get the labor leaders and you get the civil rights leaders and you get the political radicals, and that's all good. And I'm glad we did that. And the, and the suffragists and the feminists, et cetera. But, you know, I started looking at them. I was like, God damn, these people kind of suck too. <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. sure, I agree with them, of course, on civil rights, on legal rights and suffrage and the vote and unions generally and you know sure but as people and their sort of cultural outlook and their their wider vision for what the good life is it was totally depressing yeah yeah and just missing much of what life looked like in america in the 1990s and still today and certainly what i want in the world like if you asked them to sketch out their utopia you would look at it and be like no thanks sex is fucking important (laughs) right you know newsflash yeah i mean it's amazing i was like wow so so psychologists for, what, a century now have been saying that we think about sex 95% of the time, mm-hmm. yet it's not mentioned in any histories of the United States of America. Yeah. How could that be? It's weird. 
It's an incredible thing. Yeah, it's, it's weird. Incredible. I mean, we, I mean, and the culture has internalized Freud, you know, like we all yeah. accept that. And yeah. yet we don't really – Yeah, we're not really active about it at it's all. It's like walk, walk 30 blocks to Madison Avenue. They'll tell you how important sex is. Yes. yes. Idiots. Yes. You claim to be writing about everything, the history of this culture, this country, you, you, but you don't mention the most important thing in people's lives. You know what you're explaining? It's phenomenal. In some ways, why liberals are fucking dumbfounded by Trump. They're dumbfounded by why Trump is popular. They're kind of like, I don't get why this guy and what people are responding to right. here. And you're like, yeah, he's kind of crass. He's kind of nasty, sure. you know, and like th- uh, that's what Americans are. Right. I mean, and in a lot of ways, what you're describing is, I mean, I think we both have um, quite a bit of contempt for liberals. And, <laughs> and the idea is like, for me, in part, that kind of denial of uh, what gets me about liberals is, is a kind of like denial of what life is and a denial of what people are lo- really like and what desires are. And it does have something to do with that kind of sensual thing, but it's even I mean, something wider than that. It's just kind of like a, um, they want everyone to be like them, and when they're not, they get upset. Yeah, it's very imperialistic as mm-hmm. well, certainly. Yeah. Um, so I didn't know what to do with that. I just had these feelings about right, it, right, right, early on, and they're not popular ideas. And I just, <laughs> I just felt bad, and I just felt alienated, and I just, and I knew I just wasn't comfortable up there. I didn't know what to do with it. So, but I, you know, I got to do labor history because that's what you do when you're a socialist. Sure. So I did labor history, but then I something I don't know what it was, but something in me was like, God damn, you know, all these books on labor history are all about the commie unions, like all of them. I was like, that can't be the whole story, mm. like. Have all have American workers all been socialists, and we just don't know about? It? It's ridiculous. Of course, they were cherry picking, mm-hmm, right? The mm-hmm. New Left was cherry picking as historians, right? And of course, those unions existed, but you know, the AFL was far bigger than the CIO. Mm-hmm. And the Teamsters, I found out very quickly, was the largest union in the history of the United States. And so I said, "Hey, why hasn't there been a serious work on the Teamsters union? The lar- if we're interested in unions and labor, why haven't why haven't we talked about this? They're the bad guys because they're the bad guys." Why has there been no serious scholarship on Jimmy Hoffa, the most popular labor leader in the history of this fucking country? So I did it. That's what I wrote. That is that s- is that true? Is that, is that, exactly is that a claim you make, or is that because I, I don't know? I don't. I haven't read your stuff on Jimmy Hoffa, and I don't know too much about it. But is that is that true? Is that like a is that an accepted claim, or is that something that what that there was that, no, he, that Hoffa was like one of the most popular labor leaders of all time? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah I mean, no one even challenges that. Yeah. I mean, even people hostile to him don't challenge that. Yeah, there's no question. It's the only was, labor leader that I think a lot of people know. Meaning, yeah. meaning sort of within the unions, right? Mm-hmm. He was certainly more popular than Walter Ruther was. Mm. Walter Ruther always had huge factions he wanted yeah. his head. Yeah. Um, you know, and that's true for Meany and all the rest of them. I mean, Meany oh. was pretty popular too. But the so the Teamsters during Hoffa were the biggest union, and he had he was had tremendous support. There certainly were dissident factions. Mm-hmm. Don't get angry at me down there at the uh, Tamament <laughs> Library. Uh, <laughs> I know there were dissident factions. My father, my stepfather, was a member of Teamsters for a Democratic Union. In fact, he founded it. Um, so he was one of the co-founders of TDU. Mm. Um, so I am aware, but it was a very small dissident faction, mm-hmm. especially during Hoffa. TDU took off post Hoffa, mm-hmm. right? So yeah, I mean, most people would agree. Uh, even lefty labor historians would agree with me that he was the most popular uh, labor leader. So I did that. That was my dissertation. It was mm. a, was a study it was of Hoffa, but it was really a sort of an extended critique of really kind of in a way labor historiography. Mm. Um, and a critique of CIO unionism and a critique of – and the big argument in it is that competition among unions made Hoffa militant. Right, right. And made him produce yeah. the bread and butter for the membership, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and there's tons of evidence to show that. It's not that he was a nice guy. Mm. He was forced to by competition from other unions, mm. some of them CIO unions, some of them communist unions, some of them just old school AFL unions. But the competition among unions is actually a very, very good thing for the rank and file because it forces the leaders to be accountable and it forces them to be militant. It forces them to get good contracts and to keep getting good contracts, right? Because they know that if they don't, the the members can go to somewhere else. That would be nice. So, right? As a member of the so union, that I would be nice. Did. So just, guess what I just did, which is just horrifying – I just applied a market analysis to labor, right? Yeah, Which, right. Competition. Good God. So yeah. this did not go well. 
right. um, with the comrades. Um, and when you say the comrades, you mean uh, uh, professors at, uh, at Columbia that are going to be reading it, this? Yeah, yeah, they just couldn't understand why I would say such a thing. They didn't care about the evidence. They just thought it was not – couldn't be right. You passed through, though, didn't you? Did you get your PhD? Yeah, yeah. I got it. Yeah, yeah, but I didn't get distinction. <laughs> oh, boo. Uh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, no, I don't care. It doesn't matter. Um, yeah, I don't think that seems like something that would bother you. <laughs> so, yeah, like, Foner just didn't understand it. He just, mm. didn't, he just thought it was weird that someone would say such a thing, really. Because, you know, he's living in, a, in an echo chamber and has been for a long, right, long time. Right. And, yeah, he's a very smart guy and a good historian. He treated me really well until then. <laughs> um, and others had similar reactions to it like that. You know, it's just like, this can't be right. Did they think, did they suspect then, that you were, like, a secret Republican, conservative? Like, is that what, where this was coming from? I mean, they were thinking, like, this guy's some sort of, like, no, libertarian, entrepreneurial, capitalist guy. Like, what is... I don't know. I think it just caught them by surprise. And yeah. And were spinning their wheels. They because didn't know how to... Seemed, resp- it seems like a fair analysis to me. I mean, it doesn't even seem like... It seems like you're using the, like... I mean, you're using the, uh, you know, capitalist language and principles to... Yeah. But it doesn't seem like that radical a thing to say. Well, it was for them. So <laughs> Morris Isserman trashed it in, in the New York Times. Tom Zagreus sort of trashed it in the Washington Post. Bob Zeger trashed it in Labor History. <laughs> I'm so sorry you had to go through all uh, that. And then the worst was what's his face at Chicago? Uh, not Chicago. It's Circle. Um, Eric. What's his name? Anyway, he trashed it in the Chicago Tribune. Um, when you say trash, is it, this was published as a book? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. Knopf published it because it was Jimmy Hoffa, so I could get a commercial publisher. Cool. Yeah, it wasn't because it was such, so, such a great book. It was just yeah. that, I mean, I stand by it completely. But anyway, so... Uh, What's that book called? It's called Out of the Jungle, Yeah. Jimmy Hoffa and the Remaking of the American Working Class. Wicked. Um, yeah, so now then, however, I will say this, after that initial wave of like, this reaction to it by the labor historiate. Um, it did. There were, they had, people have paid attention to it over the years since then and have actually uh, agreed with mm. that basic argument. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, may, people within the labor movement um, and some academics and some journalists mm. and some other scholars have agreed. Now it's kind of there, faded. Oh, yeah. It's not I mean, when people think about me, they don't think of that book anymore, which is fine. I get it. But yeah, I mean, I come to my uh, the limits of my patience a lot with the union thing, and I, and I don't mean I don't like unions. I do. I mean, I feel like they're like. I mean, I just watched that Chomsky Requiem for American Dream thing on Netflix, and he he pretty like convincingly lays out a case that you know the the unions are are kind of in, in many ways the the only kind of institutional structure we have against uh, against capitalist exploitation. But at the same time, you know, this idea the unions have are intensely to use a word of the of of the year problematic, <laughs> um, and and and. In part, they are for me, and, and just what you're talking about, they don't have competition. I mean, most of them are, you have no choice. You join up, that's them. Well, and, 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 you know, I don't know the so details of the Verizon strike, but I get the idea that their union sold them out. Right, so quickly, I don't want to spend too much yeah. time in the weeds of labor history. But yeah, like I mean, this gets really boring. So the monopolization <laughs> of labor is is both legal and internal. So mm-hmm. um, the laws, the Wagner Act and Taft-Hartley, yeah contributed to it in various ways. It basically almost forced the unions to monopolize, um, to eliminate competition. And then the, the merger was the worst thing mm. between the AFL and the CIO in yeah. 55. Mm-hmm. That was the very worst thing, right? Right. That's like, yeah, exactly what you just said. When Verizon right. and whoever uh, merge, what happens to consumers? They get fucked. Mm-hmm. So that's what happened to the working class. Because so if you look no at... Competition. So very quickly for your listeners, yeah. if you're interested in why the union movement declined... In the, in the United States over the last 100 years. look Just look at a chart of union membership and union density over the last 100 years. You will see it rise, rise, rise from the early 20th century, rise, 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 and peak when? 1955. And then you will see the decline, steady decline, begin 1956 and all the way to today. It's declined ever since. Uh, correlation and causation, I know, are not the same things, but, gee, I think the, the fact that they monopolized uh, the movement and eliminated competition, making themselves unaccountable to the rank and file, had something to do with that. Yeah, so, sure. yeah. Sure. Um, I do want to ask you a, yeah. like a, a totally, uh, a, a totally off, off-topic question that, 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 because I, I want to make sure we talk about this before you, before you go, um, which is MMA. Um, <laughs> and, and this is, and then why, and I'll tell you why I bring this up. Cool, yeah. Because it goes along with, um, I've asked a few different like academic lefties, yeah, on this show and outside of the show, yeah. like, what do you think of MMA? Oh, really? And they're like, I don't know what that is. Are you a fan? I'm, I, I'm thinking, I don't know if I don't know if you would call me a fan. Huh. Like, I guess a little bit, yeah. Okay. I mean, I'm into it. I, I, oh. I, I like, I, I watch the fights and stuff. Then like you're that. a yeah. fan. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. I mean, cool. I'm. 
I love talking. This is my favorite subject. And, and, and what's, <laughs> I, I mean, I guess when I say I'm not a fan, it's like I, don't, I haven't gone to any. I don't like have a favorite fighter. I don't know many of their names. Or anything. What I'm interested in is like the MMA phenomenon is kind of incredible. And, and I think it taps into a lot of what you're talking about in terms of like that kind of sensual pleasure mm-hmm. body stuff yeah. that like liberals are in complete fucking denial about. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's been, it's been uh, you know, borne out by these conversations I've had with different, you know, left liberal people. Like, what do you think of MMA? They're like, even don't know what it is or they think it's just absolutely fucking the sign of the decay. Barbaric. Of, yeah. The, the, the barbaric decay of, of America and – you know, it's almost like to them, it's close to like something like the Running Man, you know, Schwarzenegger movie, where it's like we're watching a game show where people kill each other, mm-hmm. and that's that. Um, but I feel I'm feeling you have a different take on MMA. The choice before us is between socialism and barbarism. <laughs> you, yes. Eugene yes. Debs said, "Yeah, yeah," and I'm sure socialism a lot, and, and, and MMA, and I'm sure a lot of socialists <laughs> would use MMA as the. As For those that are listening the, to the show and don't know what we're talking about, MMA is mixed martial arts. It's right. fighting. The it's U- like the UFC. Now, yes. now they know what we're talking about. Okay. Yeah. So look it up. It's the it is the evidence of the decline into barbarism. I, I'm sure a lot of people would say. Um, I could see it that way. Maybe if I were on mushrooms, I might see it that way. But maybe if I were no. on mushrooms, I would see it as like you know what this is. These are monkeys. So it is for the last eight years. It has been probably the best part of my life. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Uh, I took my first boxing lesson at church. Church Street Boxing Gym uh, eight years ago, and then I started to do Muay Thai kickboxing, and I don't do MMA, but I do I do the stand up striking stuff, and have been for eight years, and it is it is the most fun I've ever had, and the most satisfying thing I've ever done, and I kind of wish I could just do that and just be a coach. Or, <laughs> um, I mean, I've and I do sparring. I have never fought. I have not done a competitive fight yet, but um, I do a lot of sparring, and I've done it in New York City, in Los Angeles, and in Portland, and yeah. Um, so. Um. <laughs> okay. Mixed martial arts so, as a cultural so, phenomenon. So yeah. th- it has to do with bourgeois culture, right? Right. So, um, you know, bourgeois culture of the 19th century, um, which of course we inherited, um, is is largely about discipline. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we are aware of the Victorian prohibitions against against sex and masturbation and all that and drinking, et cetera. Um, one of the prohibitions was against a particular kind of violence. Now, of course, imperial violence, that's fine. Military violence, fine. But street violence, anarchic, spontaneous, working class street violence, not okay, Mm. not respectable, Mm. must be controlled. Mm. So hence the rise of professional police forces Mm. in the 19th century. That was a bourgeois project, you know, right? Uh, We look down on... Uh, a street fight or a bar fight, but you know, vaporizing a village of Arabs, eh, whatever. Kick it's ass. Necessary. <laughs> or, or it's just necessary. Yeah. I mean, no, bourgeois. The bourgeois. Well, liberals, would, you're right. You're right. It isn't kick ass. For liberals, it's, hundred, it's just what we had. To not do. just, li- I mean, yeah. bourge- the bourgeoisie yeah. would look at that as, you know, a, a necessary thing. Yeah. Un- perhaps unpleasant, but we must do it, right? Mm-hmm. Sort of a clinical. They would have a clinical view of it. Yeah. Um, that attitude is grosser than a bar fight to me. But the, but their visceral reaction mm-hmm. to two guys punching each other in the face, you know, a hundred times greater, yeah. right? Than than reading details of a battle in the Philippines, you know, in the nineteen tens when they yeah. were just machine gunning in yeah. fields of brown people. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's what we're up against, you know. Those of us who like, you know combat sports what it's mm-hmm. called what it's called now which mm-hmm. i'm not i don't really love that because it's not actually combat but um yeah i mean I, so you know I, I i suppose i don't know if that's the reason i like it i mean i think there's just something about it that's satisfying i have a, obviously a lot of anger and you know i think it's really, that's what i was gonna ask like, is it sure. is it a good is it a good thing for like getting yeah. rage I mean, I, out yeah. i have a lot of anger and i always have right and mm-hmm. which has served me well in some ways and served me poorly in others and yeah no it very much helps me um i'll tell you like after <laughs> <laughs> After a day of dealing with the academic left, there's nothing better than punching a heavy bag. Uh-huh. Um, but what about MMA as like a cultural phenomenon? I mean, do you read yeah. anything into this as like a, as a kind of like wider wider <laughs> symptom of where we are? I mean, I, I don't agree that it's a, it's a symptom of barbarism, but I do think that you know when I was a kid. I remember my brothers bringing home VHS videotapes of UFC fights, mm-hmm. and it was called uh, – they were just calling it Ultimate Fighting, and it was like this – it was almost like they had porno. It was like they had porno. We had to hide it from my parents, right. put it on, and be like, 
this is illegal. Like, right. we shouldn't be watching yeah. this. Well, you couldn't still, even find it's it. It's still banned in many states, right. including this one we're sitting in. But but at the same time, like, I'm in, you know, a, a Mexican restaurant in L.A. last year, mm-hmm. and, like, on the big screen is just, like, dudes beating the shit out of each other, blood spraying all over the place, and, yeah. like, a bunch of kids watching it. And I was like, the culture has changed. Yeah, it's a, well, it's a thoroughly working-class sport. Yeah. Um, from bottom to top. I mean, just like boxing. I mean, boxing sort of, I know that upper class people and middle class people became attracted to it, but it, its origins and its essence have always been working class and it's always been attacked as such too. Um, and That's really interesting. So it's like, yeah, sure. the, 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 the hatred of MMA is in part uh, uh, part of the larger hatred of poor people. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, it's, and it's mostly by coastal elites, you know, mm-hmm. and it's probably coastal, not just liberals. I mean, you know, John McCain was the kind of leader of the anti-UFC, anti-MMA stuff. You know about, you know about that? Yeah, McCain, I, I, I'm forgetting He's, this, but it seems like... He made like... the kind of the winning argument for banning it, oh. which we called it human cockfighting very famously in the 90s. When, wow. When the UFC started, oh yeah, that was the argument that's been used by many state legislatures. And, I mean, and he's a warmonger himself. I mean, that's oh, a perfect well, example. I mean, the, like... the hypocrisy there is just beyond, <laughs> it's like over the top, but yeah. Uh, no, but I mean, liberals, I would say, are probably even more disdainful of it. Than oh, it's the same of a hatred of hip hop. Sure. It's kind of interesting to see, um, yeah. you know, like Kendrick Lamar and like certain ones like brought into the liberal circle of like, oh, we like this now and this is yeah. cool. I hate Hamilton. Con- I, I, I mean, we've I, brought Hamilton up I, several times. On I, this hate show. Yeah. I hate oh, conscious hip hop. I hate conscious hip hop. I just can't stand it. God, it's just boring. It's tedious. It's really not what it is originally. I mean, the argument I hate, what I hate most actually is the argument that's often made that. Conscious hip hop is actually the real hip hop. That's actually more authentic. <laughs> you, kn- than, you know, than, yeah. Than Lil Wayne is. That's as close. Uh, to, that's another thing. Like the <laughs> saying, uh, "I uh, I like all music except country." There's also people that say, "Like I listen to hip hop as long as it's like conscious hip hop." Right. Right. That, I don't listen to that gangster stuff. Well, okay. or I don't listen to stuff that's, a, too, that's ma- too materialistic. That's fine. Just don't claim that it's more authentic. Right. Give me. Are you? I mean, that's it. <sighs> Yeah, yeah, I know. Um, well, it's, it's interesting. I think there are intersections between the hatred or, or, or revulsion that certain people feel, bourgeois people feel about MMA and what they feel about hip hop. I mean, when you think of like Conor yeah. McGregor entering the ring with like sunglasses on and a big like fur coat, I mean, he does the whole kind of like yes. the, he does a hip hop kind of thing. Yes. You know, he comes guess, in like guess which country he's from. Yeah. Right, <laughs> You're right. So yeah. you know, my chapter. Very, on, very interesting. My my chapter on the Irish being black. Yeah, in the yeah. 19th century. Well, he never. He's one of the Irish who never left. He stayed black. <laughs> right. Uh, oh yeah, and I bet you, if I told him that, he'd be very happy with the comparison. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if he's going to stick around. Well, the, yeah. I mean, the Irish have been called, still are called, the blacks of of Europe. Yeah, I mean, still right. are. And in many ways, they identify with blacks in the United States. Um, and so that sort of that embrace of ostentation. Yeah. The celebration of the body of mm-hmm. one's own body, mm-hmm. right, which is completely anti-bourgeois, mm-hmm. right. Uh, and the left either ignores that. Or is disdainful of it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, it makes me sick. Right. That's sort of, that's why, that's, that's why, that's one of the many reasons why I've taken the direction I have. So uh, let me, we, can, yeah. we can wrap this up and, yeah, and, sure. and kind of like how, where, what direction you've taken. I mean, you, you, you graduated from Columbia um, and then you've been, you've been like kind of a journeyman in, in, in education, higher education. Mm, yeah. um, so where are you now? Aren't you, uh, are you kind of like splitting time between LA and Oregon right yeah. now? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I finished Columbia then um, in 2000, got a job as a full-time but uh, temporary professor at Barnard across the street in the mm-hmm. history department there. Great job. Did that for five years. Did really well, I thought. Um, and this is, you can read my Huffington Post piece about this. It's oh, yeah. Fairly, really, fairly well known. Yeah. yeah, your bitter resignation. Well, no, no. I was basically fired. Well, your, bitter, I was, your bitter letter. Of, I wasn't yeah. technically fired, but I was essentially fired. Yeah. yeah. So you can read it. I, don't, I won't go into the whole story here. But yeah. So um, then I – then um, but during that time, what I was doing was I was writing – I was given the American History Survey course, mm-hmm. right? Which is ironic. They didn't know what I was up to, um, and but I so I had, to, I had to write all these lectures, you know, yeah. on the whole history of the United States, right? right? And I was started to develop the arguments that became a renegade history of the United States in those yeah. lectures. And yeah. so I get fired basically, and I'm like, what the fuck am I going to do now? And I said, well, I do have these lectures that seem the students seem to like that are saying something different. Maybe this could be a book. And mm-hmm. because I was living in New York, I had some connections with publishing, and next thing I knew, I ended up getting. Um, a pretty good deal for that book, and it became Renegade. In the meantime, I got an adjunct job at the new school, taught there for a couple of years in the graduate school and it, at Lang both, and then had enough money from various things, including the book contract, um, 
uh, left New York because I hated New York at, at that point for a lot of reasons and moved to L.A. with my family and finishing the book. And then I got an adjuncting job at Occidental College there. Oh, yeah. Is that in Pasadena? Uh, n- or right near Pasadena? It. Yeah, it's in Eagle yeah. Rock right next door. Okay, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. Um, and was there, I was there for the last uh, Oxy for the last five or six years as an adjunct. Mm-hmm. One of the ghosts, as you say. Yeah, yeah. Completely true, yeah. Yeah. Um, I've, I've been an adjunct for 12 years. I think I've said that on the show before. This, uh, it's, yeah. it's starting to sink in. Yeah, and you know, and it became clear to me that, I mean, I have many strikes against me in terms of in the job market. I mean, I think the, my politics, parts of my, some of my work, and then, I mean, it's clear that it's it's really tough if you're white and a, and a guy. Mm. It really just mm. is. It's been made clear to me in, in three different job searches that I didn't get the job because I was white. Mm-hmm. Um, and you got a bad attitude. And my attitude, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> my, my ideological discrepancies don't help either. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> So, yeah, so now what I'm doing, I realize that academia is just not working for a lot of us. Mm-hmm. I'm not the only one here, right? As, yeah. you, as you well know. So what I'm doing is I am uh, developing my own alternative university called Renegade University, mm-hmm. which is going to be a series of online lectures, which will be available in, in audio and video format, and interactive seminars. And then also I'm going to do some in-person seminars in several cities, including New York, um, beginning this fall in 2016. Cool. Yeah, so I think it's going to work. I hope it's going to work. I really, you know, of course I want to sort of make money on it and and sort of establish a career independent of, of the academic establishment. And I think a lot of us can do this, but I, I really want other people to see this as a model. Well, yeah. And to start doing it themselves. Yeah, because, there, I mean, there's an army of PhDs at this Absolutely. point that are not going to get jobs. There I are, mean, there are hundreds and hundreds and thousands of very good teachers, very smart people who can't get jobs in this bullshit. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be a wasted generation of intellectuals. Put up your own shingle, yeah. start teaching people on your own. Now, with the internet and technology, we can do this now, mm-hmm, you mm-hmm. know? And there's a huge market for it. You know, I've been finding out, well, the Brooklyn Institute for Social Research, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. They, they did it before me. Yeah. I and mean, they don't do it online, but it's this independent thing. They say, and I think it's true, they've been doing it for, what, five years, six years? Yeah, yeah. They say they oversubscribe every, every class. Wow. And it's stuff that's really esoteric and academic. Cool. And they fill those classrooms. And it's, and it's professors who are not famous at all, mm-hmm. you know, and they do it. And it's 300 bucks a pop. And people, there's a huge hunger, which is a great thing, right? Yeah. yeah. A huge hunger for intellectual stimulation. Well, I mean, uh, you know, it's not just, uh, it's not just the, 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 the professors that are, that are um, feeling the pain of, of college. I mean, students aren't really into it either. Yeah, and in particularly, I'm talking about paying $70,000 for an education sure. um, and, and, and leaving college. You mean, you mean per year? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Or, or, or leaving, I mean, I think it's something like that. Most, like college students, the average college student is leaving school with like 40 grand in debt. Yeah. Like that's just the average, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and uh, many, 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 I hear, I mean, especially because I'm here at, at Baruch, which is like a very business minded kids that are like, you know, they're doing the calculations in their head of like, is this worth it or not? Should I just go do my startup now? Yeah. You know, rather than, Leave here in four years. You, with... should, you should do your startup now. Right. Yeah, I mean that. And, I, and I, I'm speaking to your, those students, and I'm speaking to us. I'm speaking yeah. to academics. Yeah. We, then we all got to become branded entrepreneurs. I've been hearing more and more people doing this, not just the Brooklyn Institute, but I've, hear, I've been hearing of, like, especially people in the sciences doing this kind of thing, where they just start doing it themselves. And you yeah. can. Um, and you can make a living. You can make a living, I think. You can do it. I um, hope you're right. So everyone, if you're listening, and you have a PhD or you're about to get a PhD, think seriously about teaching your own courses on your own terms, you're going to get some freedom, and you might actually make more money per course doing it. Well, when you lay out your utopic vision, I look at it. I, I like yeah. it a lot more than than a lot of the the others that I've that I've that I've experienced. Um, you know, Thaddeus Russell, I first saw your book in the Strand several years ago. Huh. I was walking through there, it caught my eye, Renegade History. I started flipping through it, and I said, "This is some pot, like pot smoking history of uh, <laughs> United States." And I was like, "This this fucking asshole got here first uh, <laughs> because because it's, uh, there's there are a lot of intersections." I don't, I mean, and I think people probably know that are listening to the show. I don't necessarily, I don't think we align perfectly, but I like that. Like, I don't want to align perfectly with people. You know, that's I'm cool. never going to learn anything. That's great. Um, yeah, that's and I, I really appreciate you sitting down and talking to me. Thanks, man. This has been really, really fun. 